Welcome to the USF Forest Preserve. This is a 200 hectare research and teaching facility located on the campus of the University of South Florida. It's rather unique for a metropolitan university. We're smack in the middle of the Tampa, St. Pete, Clearwater metropolitan area, and yet we have 200 hectares of old Florida here. If you go just behind us here, there's Fletcher Avenue, which is a major east-west thoroughfare just beyond his main campus, the University of South Florida. Just in that direction, we'd run into uh, the Hillsborough River and just beyond that, Interstate 75. If we go down this way, we run into developments and eventually Interstate 275. If we run that way, we run into the uh, suburban development of New Tampa. But right in the middle is this 200 hectares of old Florida. Um, it's primarily the floodplain of the Hillsborough River, and we're going to get down to that in a minute. Um, but there is this little piece of Sand Hill environment. This is rather rare now. Uh, it's dry, and we're going to see a little bit about that in a moment. These are the areas we've mostly developed in West Central Florida. So these types of areas are rather uncommon, um, uh, at least in the Tampa St. Pete Clearwater metropolitan area. What we're going to do is we're going to start here at the top of this old sand dune and we're going to move that way down into the floodplain of the Hillsborough River. And we're going to see how uh, soils and vegetation change as we move down that hydrologic gradient, eventually crossing the water table. There's going to be four stops, the first one here. Now, as you know from your handout, I've already given you a couple of pieces of information that you're going to need for your katina. One is the landform. Um, we are right now on the shoulder um, of this hill slope. The summit would be just back here. If we started on the summit, we'd be standing in the middle of Fletcher Avenue, and that probably wouldn't work out very well. So we're on the shoulder of this hill slope. We're gonna move down gradient across the back slope, down onto the foot slope, and out into the valley bottom below. Um, also on that handout, you had distances. Um, there's an arbitrary distance for the linear distance we're gonna walk. Uh, this is just arbitrarily named as zero. And, um, and we'll march on downwards towards, I think the last one is about 270 meters in that, in that direction. There's also elevation on that. We are currently at about 15.24 meters above sea level. That's the ground surface elevation. And we'll have ground surface elevations at each one of those. So what we're gonna see is that we're gonna go very short distances laterally. We're gonna make a very, very, very short uh, a drop in elevation, but the whole world's gonna change because we're gonna cross the water table along the way. So starting here, Again, we're on the shoulder of a sand dune. Um, so many thousands of years ago, uh, this was just a sand dune environment. There wouldn't have been any of these trees. There'd have been sand blowing. The dunes that have been mobile. Um, Florida became wetter maybe about 5,000 years ago. A lot of vegetation started establishing. Um, and now we have these mature forests um, that are located on them. And that kind of stitches together. So the sand dunes are sort of frozen in time. Um, we have a well here. Uh, it's simply a PVC well um, <clears throat> that's dug down to depth. And what we want to do first is to get an idea how close is the water table to the surface here. Remember, what we're interested in is what happens when we cross that water table. So this is a water, level, a water level meter. <clears throat> it's pretty simple technology. Um, it's simply a measuring tape that has a probe at the end. There's a battery inside here. There's two wires that go down either side of it. Those two wires are not connected. They're only connected when this is submerged in water. When it's submerged in water, those two wires connect across the water bridge and it's gonna send out a beep. That's gonna tell me that this is touching the water and therefore below the water table. So we're gonna run it down and you hear that? I'm going down, up, down, up. As it's beeping, that's telling me I'm below the water table and it's a measuring tape. So I take that measurement there and that is five meters and 83 centimeters or 5.83 meters. So the water table is 5.83 meters below the ground surface, or, or excuse me, below the, the, the well, top of the well casing. That's not the ground surface, is it? That's an important point. So that's 5.83 meters below the top of the well casing, right? That's not the ground surface. The next thing I need to do is to figure out how high this is above the ground surface, because remember what I gave you in the handout was true elevation of the ground surface. And what we want to know is how far the water table is below the ground surface. So I'm going to have to measure something. This is truly the technical term. It's called the stick up. <laughs> We're going to measure the stick up of this well. 
and it is 40 centimeters or 0.4 meters, right? So 5.83 meters below the top of the casing. This top of the casing is 40 centimeters or 0.4 meters above the ground surface. So the water table is 5.43 meters below the ground surface. Okay, so that's our first piece of data. The water table is 5.43 meters below the ground surface. That's quite a ways, okay? This is not a shallow water table environment. This is kind of a dry environment. Does that matter? Well, <clears throat> let's put the cap back on the well. The things that we really want to pay attention to here are uh, how that affects the soils and how that affects the vegetation. Those are going to be sort of long-term integrators of this environment. Soils take hundreds, maybe thousands of years to develop. And so uh, they're telling you a lot about what's happened over a long period of time. Um, Vegetation uh, is sort of a finer scale, but if we focus just on the trees, maybe they're telling us something about the past few decades. So they're very good integrators about what the conditions have been like here for long periods of time. So if we assume that water level is about what it normally is, which is true, um, then the soils and the, and the trees especially should be telling us a lot about um, uh, what that means in terms of the structure of this ecosystem. So let's start with the soils. And I'm just gonna take a, an auger here. We're really gonna focus our efforts on the top 20 centimeters or eight inches or so, um, because I think we're gonna learn everything we need to learn by looking right there. So I'm just gonna spin this auger down and I'm gonna pull out this and I'm gonna kinda dump it out where we can see it in the sunlight. All right keep that there so I remember where our hole is. Now, <clears throat> recall that oxygen diffuses through water 10,000 times more slowly than it diffuses through air. So when a soil is flooded, uh, the oxygen is depleted rather rapidly and all the microbes that breathe oxygen begin to suffocate and die. But there are other microbes, microbes that bring, breathe things that are not oxygen. We'll talk quite a bit, a lot more about those below. Those microbes are less efficient. Um, it's less efficient to use something other than oxygen as a terminal electron acceptor. So because of that, we note that organic matter tends to accumulate in flooded soils. Um, up here, water table's quite far down there. There's plenty of oxygen in this uh, profile. So the microbes here ought to be those oxygen breathing microbes. They ought to be quite efficient and therefore, they ought to be consuming most, if not all, of the organic matter that's dropping into the soil. So what we would expect here is to see a rather light-colored soil with very low organic matter content. And indeed, that's going to be the case. It's a little bit of black in there, maybe not so much. Mostly it's a light color. If I look very closely, I can see maybe a little bit of organic matter frosting the edges of these grains, but not much. This is mostly just mineral soil. There's very, very, very little organic matter content in here. Um, so that's our first observation, not much organic matter content. Um, before we go into any more detail on that though, let's do a couple of other things. Um, let's just, for the heck of it, figure out kind of what is it? Well, um, note that uh, it looks like sand. If I run it between my fingers, it feels like sand. Don't try this one at home. If I put it between my teeth, it grinds like sand, right? So I'm thinking there's a lot of sand in here, but there's also silt fractions. There's also clay fractions. Those are finer fractions. How would I know if there's any here? Well, let me drop that. I see my hand. If I rub it, see how there's very little staining on it? There's a little bit, right? A little bit of staining. That little bit of staining would imply that there's a very, very, very tiny amount of silt. Silt ends up staining the hand. Clay would too but I'm pretty sure there's no clay because we're gonna do a clay test. Clay test, I'm gonna take it between my thumb and forefinger and I'm gonna rub it out. And see how it just falls apart like grains? If there was clay in here, I could make ribbons. They would come off my thumb and forefinger and I could get ribbons out an inch, maybe two or even three inches in really high clay content soils. There's hardly any clay, if any clay at all in there. I'm gonna say there's not even really any silt in there, just a very little bit. This is sand. It's a fine grain sand, so we're gonna call it a fine sand, right? 
So write that down too, it's a fine sand, all right? We could modify it, right? If we thought there was plenty of silt in here, we'd still wanna call it a fine sand, but we might call it a silty fine sand. If I thought that there was enough staining on my hand to justify that, I might say, yeah, this is a silty fine sand, but I don't think so. We're just gonna say that this is a fine sand. Another thing we can do is the texture. You know, sometimes you dig up some soil and you pull it out and it comes out in clods. And if you're a boy, when we were kids, we used to have dirt clod fights. Those are actually not called clods. Technically, they're called peds. Um, and that's a structural form that the soil might take on. Um, most dirt clods, if you will, is what's called subangular blocky structure. Okay, there's all kinds of other different ways we could describe soil structure, but note this, this doesn't really have any structure at all, right? If I hold it out there, it just falls apart. If I try to rub out some ribbons, it just comes apart, right? And it's acting more like individual grains. Okay, and that should give you the hint of why we call this granular structure. Okay, so this is a fine sand with granular structure. We note that there's very little organic matter content, but we'd like to quantify that organic matter content in some way, even if it's just a proxy measurement. And so what we're going to do is <clears throat> we're going to get out a Munsell soil color chart. Now, I was actually in the hardware store yesterday thinking about this. And you know, when you go to the hardware store and you're going to paint your bathroom and you say, oh, I really like those colors and this one's called holiday in barbados or butterfly wings or let's have a party um, but maybe you think no nah, i like earthier colors how about that well there's floppy hat cup of tea and chopped sage right? and they've all got these great names they use the name to sell it to you but you'll note each one of these also has a number associated with it if you look very closely okay it's because these colors aren't just names they're defined by their numbers and there's a couple of different numbering systems the one we use for soils is called the Munsell color system. Now the Munsell color system is really three numbers combined into one. There's hue, there's value, and there's chroma. Okay, hue is sort of the basic color. Hue could be purple, um, but we don't have any purple soils. So Munsell soil color charts don't have a purple page. They do have yellow pages, so it's 2.5 Y for yellow. So here's a red page, 10R for red. Sometimes there's somewhere in between. We're gonna go to the 10YR. So that's a yellow red page, that's somewhere in between. Note that it's not really yellow and it's not really red, it's somewhere in between. Okay, that's the hue, it's basically the color of that soil. The value is the brightness from really bright to not so much, right? Really bright to not so much. And then the chroma is sort of the purity. How pure is that color? from really pure to sort of washed out and pastel. Okay, so we've got hue, value, and chroma. <clears throat> and so the intersection of all those on this 10YR page with a certain value and a certain chroma would be one of these chips. And we're gonna compare our soil to those chips, figure out which one it is, and that's gonna give us sort of a quantitative measure of what the color of this soil is. Now normally, we're supposed to do this moist. So I'm gonna take a little bit of, it, it's July 11th, by the way, for us. So I was able to do this with a little bit of sweat. So yeah, I've made, ma managed to make that soil slightly moist. I'm gonna to try to get it into the real sun. And I'm gonna say, I like that one right there. And so the way I'm gonna write this is hue, value, chroma in that order. The hue is 10YR. The value is four, you put a slash after that, and the chroma is four. So it's 10YR, four slash four. That's a rather brightly colored soil. Brightly colored would imply not much organic matter, which is what we thought was true in the first place. But now we've got some sort of a quantitative measure for it. Okay, so now let's just summarize the soils. These are fine sands, granular structure, with a color of 10YR, four slash four, which implies not much organic matter, right? So those were the soils. Now we also wanna take a look at, at uh, the vegetation. So we've already pre-selected a location just up here behind me and to the right. So let's head on up here and take a look at what the trees are telling us. So recall from the handout that we're gonna use the point center quarter method for determining the density 
of tree species. We could do any kind of species we wanted up here. We could use this grass or maybe one of those forbs there. Um, but those are much shorter lived species. They're integrating over maybe the last few months, maybe the last few years. Uh, the trees are much older, therefore they're integrating over a much longer period of time and are probably a better proxy for the uh, hydrologic conditions over the long term here uh, on this sand hill environment. So we're only going to be measuring the trees. We're going to do the point center quarter and we're going to do that, uh, oops, right here. The first thing we have to do, we have our point, but we need to set up our quadrants. So I'm going to take this out. North is that direction. So if you recall, we need to cut this into four quadrants. We're going to do a north and east quadrant, a north and west quadrant, and equal quadrants to the south. Um, I'm going to need one volunteer to hold the smart end of the tape. So let's start in the northeast quadrant. Um, you need to take this to the nearest tree. That's actually not a tree, it's a shrub. So if you go to that tree that's just beyond it, keep going, that one right there. All right, and so that is five meters. Okay, so write that down, five meters. That's called D1. All right, Celeste, you can drop that, bring it back here. The next one is that one. No, it's this one right here. So if you take it just to that nearest one right there, yep. It's in the next quadrant down. We're gonna call this D2. And that is three meters, all right? So write that down. D2 is three meters. The next quadrant is right here. So it's that tree there. I'm gonna take it to that one. And that is 3.1 meters. Okay, so D3 is 3.1 meters. And the last one is actually this really close one right here. So you take it to that one there. And we will be done. D4 is 3.0 oh, please. Oh. Well, there it is. It's 2 meters. 2.0 meters. All right. So those are your four distances, right? Now the distances don't do us any good unless we tell you what species those are. So I'm gonna walk down here and take a look. This was our first tree, the D1 tree. This is a leaf off of it. Looks like a bird foot, maybe like a turkey foot. It's called a turkey oak, okay? That's a turkey oak. That was D1. Back up over here. This is another kind of oak. Okay, it's kind of hard to get the live leaves because I'm not quite that tall. But that's a laurel oak. All right, so there's a laurel oak here as well. The other one was this one here. It's a pine, obviously, right? But which one is it? There's actually two out here. All right, so I'm gonna grab all these here. Okay, pine needles grow in what are called fascicles. A fascicle is this group of needles that are wrapped by this sheath, okay? So there's one fascicle, two fascicle, three fascicle, four fascicles. We ought to be able to do our job with this. Note that there are three needles in that fascicle, three needles in that fascicle, three needles in that fascicle, and you're probably getting the hang of this, there's three needles in that fascicle. The other thing we might want to do is measure the length of those needles, and we're going to find that these are about, oh, 30 to 40 centimeters, okay? Now, if you look on your sheet, it's on the last page of your handout, there's a little bit of a cheat sheet there on vegetation. And you'll note that the longleaf pine, needles, three per fascicle, and needles are 20 to 45 centimeters in length. So that's a longleaf pine. So the D3 is a longleaf pine. And then the last one, D4, was back to this guy again. Same thing we saw before. 
And you guys know now that is a turkey oak, okay? So D1 and D4 were turkey oaks. D2 is a laurel oak. And D3 was a longleaf pine, right? And you can see at the very end of the handout how to use the distances and the species composition to calculate both the total density of trees per acre here, but also by using the proportion, half of them were turkey oak, a quarter of them were laurel oak, and a quarter of them were longleaf pine to give me the, the density of each one of those species at this location. We're gonna move on to station two. Station two is just down that way. Um, it's maybe 150 meters in that direction, maybe about five meters lower in elevation, but we're gonna see a lot of things are gonna change because we're gonna get somewhat closer to the water table.